Welcome back to the Nick and Joe Show. We have uh, a studio with us this evening, uh, Chris Frazier. He's a good friend of the show and a good friend of ours. And we just wanted to uh, get his in- input tonight. Uh, he spent some time down in Florida and share- shared some insights into what Florida's like compared to the rest of uh, you know, the rest of Canada. Um, what life's like here in Ontario, I should say, at least. And we've been through that, and we've talked about a bunch of other things. But the next, uh, the next segment, I think, is, is an important one. But before we get into it, i got to tell you. Now, when I say this, there, understand that I have loved this kind of music since I was about six or seven years old. My mother taught me. What's that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm hearing voices in the background. I think there's a ghost talking to me. Anyway, uh, she taught us a lot of the old Irish Rover songs like... Um, the schooner I'm alone and the, uh, the, uh, the old Bolina and all this stuff. It had a really good work rhythm to it. So we would use it when we were out in the fields. So I've liked sea shanties since the earliest in time in my memory. I've just, it's always been a part of our lives. Now, all of a sudden on TikTok, the uh, social media platform, TikTok, somebody's recorded a song called the Weller man. It's a, it's a New Zealand whaling song out of the 1700s, and it has exploded. And along with it, everybody's doing this Wellerman song, and it's a lot of fun. It's a great song to sing to. You can hum along, tap your toe to it. And, you know, if you're going for a walk, it'd be a good tune to walk to. It's the right cadence. So a lot of people have all of a sudden discovered sea shanties. And I looked at my family, my kids yesterday, and I said, do you realize that we can honestly say, with no reservation at all, that we have liked sea shanties before they were cool, we like them now that they're cool, and we will continue to like them when they are no longer cool, which I thought was kind of cool. So this the sea shanty stuff is just, oh, my good Lord. If you want to get an understanding of the power of sea shanties, watch a movie called The Fisherman's Friend. I won't tell you any more than that, but you got to watch it. It's just incredible. It's a great family-friendly movie, and uh, you'll really enjoy it. Yeah, I, I saw The Fisherman's Friend. It was a very good movie, I have to say. But, you know, I'm picturing I'm picturing you guys down in the boiler rooms there, Nick, singing your sea shanties while you're punching those uh, tubes and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, nobody and, can hear a word. Well, uh, I, uh, what can I say, Nick? We weren't, we weren't listening and we were not singing sea shanties in the officer's ward room. <laughs> <laughs> of that, I couldn't too because I was never as a higher as, as a lower decker allowed in the wardroom. Well that's not true. I was in the wardroom I think twice. Uh, once for the baptism of my daughter mm-hmm. and my uh, my oldest boy, Peter. Did he get baptized on board? Anyway, so the wardroom was not a place that I spent a lot of time. But no. the only time we would sing is when we were doing cleaning stations. You know, scrubbing down the, the, the flats between frame 36 and 54 and if you don't know what i'm talking about if you're listening to us don't worry about it it's just an internal part of the ship at a hallway that we had to clean and that was our responsibility when we came off uh the watch that uh went from eight in the evening until midnight uh and uh we would get out and and scrub down the engineering flats and that we do a lot we'd sing sea shanties and stuff like that there because you could you you could hear each other and in the spaces forget it and uh, and not tonight, Nick, but sometime in the near future, we are going to have a serious conversation on air about dumping brass valves overboard. <laughs> but oh, my God. Not, not tonight. Not tonight. We want to talk. We'll put that under another heading. Okay. So. Uh, All right. So, um, so Big Tech, the, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, etc., and all of the talk about big tech censoring conservatives. And and uh, is it fair to say conservatives, or just is it more accurate to say censoring anyone who doesn't toe the party line, uh, whether you're conservative or, or not? Because I, I say this because I've, there are a lot of people out there who, uh, who call themselves conservatives, uh, and I just don't think they really are. And I don't mean that as a criticism. I'm just saying, you know, there's this there's this need on the part of these big tech companies now to enforce some kind of conformity of thought. Uh, and uh, 
Okay, so as they say, discuss amongst yourselves. Well, I'll let Chris go first, then I'll jump in. I'm a big fan of free speech, and most people would say, yes, so am I. I I believe in free speech. But what happens is somebody says something, um, like a certain ex-president, and all of a sudden, oh, no, he shouldn't be able to say that. Let's take him off this platform. Well, that's not that's not free speech. And it's it's very scary in a you know, Western democracy when you can see the leader of the free world being told you can't have this platform. Um, one of the questions I would ask people who don't agree with that statement, when Martin Luther King gave his famous uh, I Have a Dream speech, what if we had had Twitter back then or, or Google and YouTube and someone would say, oh, uh, sorry, you can't say that. We're taking that speech down because it, it offends us. What? How would the civil rights movement have uh, progressed if somebody had not allowed him to do that speech. So you, you can't have it both ways. Over to you, Nick. I think you're absolutely right. I think having it both ways is, 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 is uh, they have another word for that. It's called hypocrisy. And because you can't, it's like saying, well, you know, I'm going to face the West and the East at the same time. You simply can't do it. You, you just, you, it's either see the thing one of the reasons why they're trying let me advance this because I'm just babbling at the moment but one of the reasons why free speech is so important is because it is one of the main pinnacles if I could list three of our rights that are absolutely vital to a, um, a stable society um, I, I would normally add and say four and probably yeah you know, I have protect life uh, from beginning to end. Uh, that I take that as a given. The other three are right, the own, right to own, use, and dispose of private property, the right to free speech, and the right to um, uh, uh, what's the other one? The free having a free press. Well, one kind of rubs the hand, washes the hand of the other. Um, but when you see them trying to be repressed, it's because the people who want to take control or want to tell you how to live your life, but have no interest in living by these same rules, when they are confronted with arguments they cannot refute, they start saying things like, you're a this, or you're a that. They go automatically to the epithets. And how can you have a conversation with someone who has nothing to say but call you down about things you don't know about? And free speech is their enemy, because if they have to give you equal time, uh, then you'll shred their argument, and they can't handle that. They, they know they'd lose that conversation. At least the leaders of, of uh, uh, the people who set those trends, uh, and in this case, it's the social media platforms, uh, is why conservatives are being defunded on YouTube and, or be franchised on YouTube or whatever the term is. And it's why uh, Trump can't get a platform on any major um, uh, media outlet, because... They're afraid of what he has to say. It's not that they don't, they, they hate him because they fear him. And they hate people who use facts, common sense, logic, and reason. Because there's no antidote for that except emotion. And emotion you can't maintain all the time. Especially when you're not right. Well, and that I think is the number one factor. You know, I, you'll recall that uh, I spent a few years uh, essentially in the trenches. Uh, working for the Jewish Human Rights Group, B'nai B'rith. And uh, I was uh, spent a year as their uh, director of communications. And, uh, you know, we dealt with, from time to time, uh, people, uh, anti-Semites, and that posting on social media. Uh, and uh, so there are people out there that are have less than honorable intentions. Uh, and, uh, you know, they use these things to, to spread hate. Uh, and uh, so the desire to control what goes on on these uh, platforms uh, in cer certain circles is, again, it's, it's not bad. But here's the problem. The problem is that once you start telling people that they can't talk or they can't express themselves for better or worse, uh, what you're essentially doing is you're saying, okay, we have to have a, a standard 
uh, which is a nice and polite way of saying uniformity of thought and uniformity of expression of expression and again for for reasonable not not bad reasons now i'm i'm keeping donald trump and conservatives out of this conversation for a moment okay uh i'm so I, i'm i'm not saying that uh that every time you want to tell somebody, okay, we're not going to give that person a platform, that it's 100% a bad thing, at least that it's 100% motivated, the motivation is 100% bad, I should say, or the motivation is bad 100% of the time. But the problem, the problem is that once you've achieved, you know, this is where you have the law of unintended consequences. Once you've achieved that, universe, that un- uniformity of thought, that uniformity of expression, what's acceptable expression and what's not acceptable. Now you have to have somebody that's making that decision. That's right. Okay. You and, 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 and you have to have a mechanism to enforce those decisions. And we, we've we talked, you know, again, earlier on in this show and, and in another show is also, uh, if you want to catch the early podcasts uh, that you'll, probably pick some of this conversation up if you're not listening to us live is that governments get it wrong okay that it's it's not the problem is not the decision that the government is making the problem is the government creating a an environment where they have the power to impose one form of thought or one form of expression or another and you could do this, you could institute this for all of the right reasons. But once you've established that precedent, once you've established that power and that process and that procedure, it's only the, the only problem is now somebody who has a more nefarious intention taking over whatever the institution is, the government or whatever, okay, and then enforcing those rules using the mechanism, the law, the way it is, uh, uh, for uh, for you know ne- nefarious purposes. So for me, the real danger is not that people; it's not what people say. For me, the real danger is control of what people say. That's the real danger. Um, and, you know, I, I wish I had the quote in front of me because I can't say it anymore. I cannot say it as well as as he did. But Frederick Hayek, who was no conservative, he would, he's, if I was to say Frederick Hayek was a conservative, he'd roll over in his grave. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, he just did not consider himself to be a conservative. But he said it far better than I can. And again, I wish I had the quote in front of me. Um, it, it's it's not it's 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 the the limitation of power that is the guarantee of liberty. That's you have to limit power. You have to limit the ability of the government of any single branch of the government to be able to impose its will on people. And that's the danger. The danger I see is that, and and I think you're starting to see this emerging now, where where now there is a particular political party in the states, the Democrats, uh, with a particular political ideology, a particular point of view, uh, and 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 now what they're saying is, well, uh, we're going to we're going to take this culture of control, uh, and we're going to use it for our political purposes, and. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not expressing it very eloquently, and perhaps I, I should have given it a little bit more thought. But you can see where I'm going with this. It's uh, it, it's it's wrong. It's the we were talking before the show about Governor DeSantis uh, in, in Florida mm-hmm. talking about in, in, uh, introducing legislation to control essentially Twitter, how they behave, etc. I don't want to control it. I don't want to give the government that control. I don't want to have rules imposed.